In this video, I'm gonna to explain to you how to properly evaluate cryptocurrency tokenomics. And if you're completely unfamiliar, tokenomics stands for token economics. And in this video, I'm gonna to explain to you three key criteria that you need to analyze when taking a look at an investment into a certain cryptocurrency project. Those three things that you need to look at is number one, understanding the supply of the tokens. Number two is you need to understand the monetary policy. And then number three is you need to understand the token distribution. In this video, we're going to cover all three of these and I'm actually going to give you examples so you'd see how I would actually go ahead and look at a cryptocurrency's tokenomics. This is extremely important that you understand how to do this properly because you can basically eliminate probably half of cryptocurrency investments just on the tokenomics alone. This is going to help you become a better investor, a more intelligent investor, and ultimately help you make more money once you understand tokenomics thoroughly. So with that being said, let's get into it. My name is Adam Winnig. I've been trading cryptocurrency since 2014, and I created this channel to help make crypto investing easy, lucrative, and fun. So if you're interested then go ahead and click like and subscribe and we've got a ton of helpful videos on this channel so let's go ahead and let's talk about it these three keys number one is supply number two is the monetary policy and number three is the token distribution starting off with supply so here's the main things that you want to understand about a cryptocurrency's supply. The first thing is you'll notice that there's two different types of supplies. There's the circulating supply, which this is the amount of coins or tokens that are currently in circulation and in the community. The other metric is called the max supply. And the max supply is the maximum amount of tokens or coins that'll ever be in existence. So for Bitcoin, for example, you can see that it has a circulating supply of about 19 million and has a max supply of 21 million, meaning there'll never be more than 21 million Bitcoin. Now, with that being said, on coin market cap, you can also see this gray bar right here and you can see what percentage of the circulating supply is all or what's percentage percentage of the max supply is already in circulation. You can see that there's nearly 90% of the total max supply already in circulation. Now, with that being said, let's take a look at a few different assets. Here's another asset. This is Ethereum, which you're probably familiar with. And you can see with Ethereum, there's actually no max supply, which is interesting. And we'll talk about this when we talk about monetary policy in just a second. But this is basically in an inflationary uh, cryptocurrency, which we'll talk more about in just a second. Now, the circulating supply of Ethereum is currently 119 million ETH in circulation. Now, if we take a look at another cryptocurrency like Hedera Hashgraph or HBAR, you can see that it has a max supply of 50 million coins and has a circulating supply of only 18 billion. Now, this means that only 36% of the total max supply is in circulation. So one thing that you may want to be aware of is if there's a huge difference, meaning that there's going to be like, what is this? There's going to be 32 billion more of this uh, cryptocurrency that comes onto the market. So obviously, as more and more of these coins flood the market, this could have a negative effect on price. So one thing that I like to look at is I like to look at the difference between the market cap and the fully diluted market cap. And this can help us make better investment decisions. So to bring it back to Bitcoin for a second, the market cap is basically a general way to tell how big this cryptocurrency is or how much value this cryptocurrency has. And to calculate the market cap, you basically just multiply the current price of it times the circulating supply. And that's going to give us the market cap. That's essentially how big it is. And you don't want to rate cryptocurrencies based on the price. You really want to rank them based on the market cap. The price really doesn't have anything to do with it. It's more about the market cap that gives you a, a, a an idea of the size and the adoption of a certain cryptocurrency. Now, the fully diluted market cap, this is essentially the max supply times the current price. So the fully diluted market cap is pretty much always going to be larger than the market cap. Now, one thing when analyzing tokenomics is that you want to find 
where there's not a huge discrepancy between the market cap and the fully diluted market cap. If the fully diluted market cap is way, 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 way bigger than the market cap, this means that a lot of coins are still yet to be issued. And this means that, you know, this could potentially have a downward effect on the price of the asset. Now, if you look at Ethereum, for example, it's kind of hard to calculate the fully diluted market cap because there's no max supply on Ethereum, right? But if we go to Hedera Hashgraph, for example, we can see it has a 50 billion max supply. So you can see there's quite a difference. The $4 billion market cap compared to the $12 billion fully diluted market cap. So this means that still a lot of these coins Tokens are going to be issued, which uh, generally, you know, inflation is generally not great for an asset. Now, it doesn't always have to be like that. I'll explain that in the next section. So this is all about the supply. You need to understand the circulating supply, the max supply, the market cap and the fully diluted market cap. Now, the next thing that we want to talk about is the monetary policy. Now, unlike central banks, the monetary policy of cryptocurrencies is actually set in code. And that way we're actually able to know what's going to happen with the monetary policy. With central banks, right, we don't have any idea. They could come out one month, they have a meeting, they say, hey, we're going to print $2 trillion like we saw last year happen in America, which was totally unplanned for. And if you look at examples like, uh, you know, Venezuela or Turkey or Zimbabwe, some of these countries that have experienced hyperinflation, I'm sure the owners of these currencies they didn't expect this monetary policy to have so much inflation or so much new supply come onto the market. And that's one of the things that makes cryptocurrency beautiful is the fact that it's completely transparent. So regarding monetary policy, there's really two main types of policies. It's either going to be a deflationary asset or it's going to be an inflationary asset. And let me explain how this actually works. A deflationary monetary policy basically means that you have a set max supply. Like in Bitcoin for this example, we all know that Bitcoin has a max supply of 21 million Bitcoin. There'll never be more than 21 million Bitcoin. And this makes it deflationary because every four years, as you know, there's this halving, which basically means that uh, you know, half of the amount of Bitcoin can be mined. Essentially, that makes this a deflationary model. Now, on the other hand, we have an inflationary model, which if you're familiar with any fiat currency, it's an inflationary model, right? They can continue to print more and more and more of this currency. Now, to put it into perspective, Ethereum is an inflationary token model. And if you look at it, any currency and generally a lot of proof of stake cryptocurrencies, uh, they don't have a max supply. So they're inflationary in nature and they do this so that way they can pay rewards out to the stakers of the network and they can, they can reward people for staking or setting aside um, their cryptocurrency to help uh, validate the proof of stake network. So with that being said, there is a caveat to this because even though Ethereum is inflationary and new Ethereum continues to be pumped into the market, at the same time, Ethereum has actually been deflationary. And you may be thinking, Adam, how the heck is it deflationary if there continues to print more and more Ethereum or more and more Ethereum comes onto the market? And with Ethereum's newest upgrade, they had in what's called an EIP-1559 upgrade. Basically, they took a percentage of all of the uh, transaction or gas fees that happen in Ethereum and they burned them. And this is another thing that you need to understand about monetary policy is burning. Certain cryptocurrencies like Ethereum, they'll burn some of their supply. Or if you take a look at uh, BNB, Binance Coin, uh, essentially they burn a, a percentage of their supply every single quarter. And this can actually have actually a really good effect on the price of the asset because as you know, if it's a deflationary asset, then uh, generally that's a good sign for prices because the asset becomes more scarce. And that's why Bitcoin has performed so well over time is mostly because of the scarcity. And with Ethereum now, even though new Ethereum is being issued into the market with the EIP-1559 up Upgrade, you can see that there's already been like $5 billion of Ethereum that has been burned. And in the last month, they burned nearly a billion dollars, $871 million, which is actually a lot of the times making Ethereum a deflationary asset. So that's something else that you need to understand when looking into tokenomics is the burning. Now, the last thing that we really want to take a look at, and this is probably the thing that is maybe going to move the needle the most, is the token distribution. 
And this essentially, as you probably could have guessed, is how the tokens are actually distributed amongst different players in a cryptocurrency community. Now, there's two different types of distributions. One is called a fair launch. And a fair launch is when a crypto is mined, earned, owned, and regulated by the entire community. If you can see a fair launch, generally, this is more favorable for investing. Okay. An example of a fair launch would be something like Bitcoin. Now, if you don't quite understand what a fair launch is, when I explain what a pre-mine is, you'll pretty much get the idea of what a fair launch is because it's pretty much exact opposite. Now, there's also something called a pre-mine. You may also hear it as like a pre-sale. And essentially what this is, is a percentage of the tokens prior to it actually being available to the public will actually be uh, given or awarded to uh, certain members of the team, or it may be rewarded to developers or even to early investors to essentially a private round of fundraising. And uh, a lot of the times this can include VCs or venture capitalists that can get access to these tokens prior. Now, this is a good and a bad thing. It's bad because these guys that get in at basically pre-sales, they're going to get in it. And once the token goes public, a lot of the times this is bad because they can dump on you, right? Because they're going to be up so much and they can dump their tokens on you, which I'll explain a little bit more in a second. But it's also, you have to understand, they are the ones taking the risk before the project's even live. A lot of times when the project's just an idea, they take a massive amount of risk. And so they do get rewarded for doing so. So anyways, long story short, just to break this down for you, you can see that from Mazari.io, we can see how these are allocated. And generally, as a general rule of thumb, the less that is uh, given to insiders, the better, okay? If less is given to the team and to VCs at pre-sale prices, the better because they don't have the ability to dump on you, right? And in a fair launch, there's no tokens that are given to pre, you know, to investors or to the team or to, um, you know, uh, VCs prior. So let's go ahead and take a look at this. So Solana, for example, here, you can see that 48% of all the tokens were actually given to insiders. Now this can be a red flag. And I'm not saying this doesn't make a project good. There's many other factors that you need to um, analyze when deciding to invest into something. But it is interesting that nearly half of the supply is from insiders. So uh, this is just something to really to uh, look out for, right? If you take a look at Kadena, for example, you can see that only 23% was actually allocated to insiders. If you look at Celo, 44%, Avalanche, 42%. Uh, flow 58%, uh, near 38%. And the general rule of thumb is the less that's allocated to insiders or to the presale or to the team or to VCs, uh, the better. And uh, again, just think about this. VCs or the team, they get in and they get on an early price and say they get in at 10 cents. And then for example, when the token first comes to the market, to the public, it's worth, you know, a dollar. These guys are already up 10 X. So the chances of them dumping on you is likely. Okay. And if they all sell at the same time, which happens time and time again, then this caused the price of the cryptocurrency to fall dramatically. Now, I'd say the last thing that you really want to understand is do you want to understand what vesting means? And a lot of these cryptocurrency projects, they're not so dumb to just allow these VCs or these insiders or the people on the team just to dump the token as soon as it's publicly available or else that may be really bad for future adoption. If the coin just dumps, nobody's going to want to touch the thing, right? So there's something called vesting and vesting essentially what it means is how long is it going to take for people to be able to receive these tokens that they bought at a presale price. And for example, if you look at Uniswap here, the unit token, they actually had a four year release schedule, which is really good. The longer the release schedule, the better. And I like to see that there's like a minimum of 12 months. What does that mean? If there's a 12 month linear vesting schedule, that means over the course of 12 months, those tokens are going to slowly be leaked out to people. Okay. Now also you may hear of something called like a cliff and basically there could be a situation where say VCs, for example, uh, they get to claim like 10% of their tokens right at the 
TGE, which is the token generation event, basically when it becomes public. So they can uh, get 10% and then they may have like a three month cliff, which basically means for three months, they don't get any other of their tokens that they were able, they're not able to sell any of their tokens that they got at the pre-sale prices. And then there may be another linear vesting schedule where the remaining 90% are released to them over the course of say a year or 18 months or two years, for example. And again, the less tokens that are allocated to VCs or to insiders, generally the better. And also the longer the vesting schedule is, also this is better because it doesn't mean that people are all gonna dump all at one time it may be released slowly over time. And as these coins go into circulation over time, slow by slow, it may not affect price that much. So if we take a look at this, for example, this is a crypto called AAG. It basically has their vesting schedule right here. And generally you can see this in their white paper. Um, and you can see that the team has a one year lockup. Uh, and then it has daily vesting over three years. So basically for one year, uh, they're not able to, uh, uh, claim any of their tokens. And then over three years, they're slowly, their tokens are released, which I would say is pretty good. Now for the advisors, there's an eight month lockup and daily vesting over three years. I would say this is also really good. For private backers in this scenario, you can see that 10% uh, was allocated to private investors and it looks like it's unlocked at the token generation event, which is basically when it goes public. There's a six month lockup and then 90% of the allocation over the course of 18 months, okay? So these are the things that you wanna know. And if this video was helpful, consider uh, giving it a like and subscribe to our channel. We have a ton of other helpful videos on our channel. And I'll say that if you really understand these three key metrics, uh, the supply, the monetary policy, and then the distribution of the tokens, you're going to be way, way better off, probably better than 90% of crypto investors out there. Also, if you'd like to just have us do the research for you, or if you'd like to just follow our crypto plays as we make them, our passive income plays, new tokens that we're getting into, all of that, then consider becoming a member at blueedgefinancial.com slash crypto. And I'll put a couple videos here on the end card so that way you can enjoy some of the other videos on our channel.